Let me let me uh, start off by just doing a little word association. So you, uh, whatever I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a word and uh, say what kind of comes to your mind when you hear that word. Okay. Uh, librarian. Glasses. Was that glasses? Book? Glasses. Okay. Glasses. Uh, book. All right. Uh, sumo wrestler. Fat. Right. Um, <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, pirate. Hook. Treasure. Hair. Ship. A ship. Yeah. Uh, church. Christian. People. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We, get, we got a lot of good answers. Like, uh, but, <clears throat> you know, I kind of want to know, what is it that comes to your mind when you hear a church? Would you say that today, people that you know, or would you know anybody who said, you know, I love, or like, I believe in God, I even love Jesus, but I don't like the church. Have you run into anybody like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or uh, sometimes they don't like anybody. But most people still like Jesus, you know. <laughs> it's like no matter what uh, faith you have. Uh, but it's, it's usually the church that turns uh, people off. And it might be their own experience with the church. Or it could be, you know, their own the characteristic uh, or the way that people have characterized the church. Or, you know, it could be, it could be real or, or false things. In, but, <clears throat> but nonetheless, the church has a little bit of a problem. In the West in particular. Um, you know, we are, um, the, the church in the West and the U.S. is, you know, people who have self-identified as Christian is dropping every generation. You guys probably know that. I don't need to kind of say that. Uh, especially with the, in the Euro tribal space, because there is a lot of uh, language, different language of churches that are growing and thriving in the West, but typically uh, a lot of churches on the, on the, on the decline. So <clears throat> I want to... But, and we all have like ways that we see the church. Like, uh, if I had to, you know, maybe pull in a little bit more uh, what your words like. If you had to pick like three words that describe the essence and kind of function of the church, and you only had three words to describe it as completely as possible in those three words, what three words would you use? By the way, if you have a hard time coming with three words, I ask pastors this a lot, and they have a hard time as well. So. <laughs> Don't be intimidated. <clears throat> Togetherness. Togetherness. Family. Okay. Submission. What's that? Submission. Love. Love. Submission. Mission. Do you say? Submission. Submission. Submit. All right. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. You used up all. Used up all. Wait, what's the disclaimer? Right. Right. Is that one? There's a lot said there, but say that. all right. What else? Teaching. Teaching. Okay. Community. Pardon. Community. Community. Kind of like there's some Community. common elements there. What else? Three three words that kind of sum up. Community. Commission. Communion. <laughs> Communion. <laughs> Communion. <laughs> hey. Uh, great. No. Yes. Actually, like uh, if you if you kind of think of the the church in our essence, it would be three words good to describe it is communion. Now you, some people can say worship community or mission, but I like to say communion, because when you think of worship, sometimes we think about not just the service on Sunday, but the particular part of the service when we sing. But worship is, is much more than that. But communion, it's hard to kind of take away something that, you know, communion you think of as something as an everyday potential experience, right? Uh -huh. It's our relationship with God. And uh, community is the other big part, right? It's like, that's a big part of what it means to be the church. Uh, and then commission is the commission that Christ gave us to make disciples, to be a blessing to the world, um, to see more beauty and justice take place, a little bit more of heaven on earth, if you will. You know, that's why Jesus taught us to pray, may your kingdom come and your will be done on heaven. No, earth. on earth. On earth is it in heaven. You know, that's the, that's the prayer. And that's really kind of what should be forming what our mission looks like. Um, and so these three things are important. If you do away with any of those three, you don't have the church anymore. So, for example, if you're a community that have a mission, without God, you're just kind of a, a, a you know, nothing bad. It's a, it's a do-good type of group. Uh, but you probably uh, <clears throat> will eventually, uh, you know, it'll be problematic in some way. Either, like, not be, able, not be able to sustain ourselves in that. Some people want to do good things. But disconnecting from God, the Creator... Uh, doesn't kind of, you know, that, that's a, a must be in the church, right? You can have communion and community with no mission, and that's either a dying church 
we're a dead church <laughs> because uh, the whole point of existing is to be on mission together. And so all of these three interrelate, and all three of them are important. But in essence, these are the, you, you could describe the church very fully with these three elements. And, you know, you could add metaphors to them, you know, community, it could be family, uh, body of Christ, if, if we're the hands and arms of Jesus, that could be deal with mission, right? Uh, so there's, but all of these are needed. Now, when you, if this is what the church is, if in, in essence it's communion, what's the second one? Mission. Commission. Community and commission. All right, let's try it again. So we've got first is community, 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 community commission. And commission. All right, we'll have that. If we have those three, then what it means to be the church uh, can really be different based on the context, based on the people. Uh, in other words, like we all have this imagination of what church is supposed to be. And I, I want to fundamentally challenge what you think church is. And it's certainly not a building, and it's certainly not a service. It, it's, it's, it's really formed around these things here. But we all have a set of glasses that affect the way that we see the world and the way that we view the church. Uh, recently, there were several people making claims about Jesus' origins, and one person said, I'm going to give you three good reasons that I believe Jesus was an Italian. He loved to talk with his hand, he had wine with every meal, and he used olive oil quite a bit. <laughs> Someone from California said, I'm going to give you three reasons why I believe Jesus was a Californian. He never cut his hair, he walked around barefoot all the time, and he started his own religion. <laughs> uh, then a black person declared, I'm going to give you three reasons I believe Jesus was black. He called everyone brother, he liked gospel, and he couldn't get a fair trial. <laughs> and then after that, a woman gave the most compelling evidence of why uh, three proofs that Jesus was a woman. He had to feed a crowd at a moment's notice when there was no food. He kept trying to get a message across to a bunch of men who just didn't get it. And even when he was dead, he had to get up because there was more work for him to do. <laughs> so, anyway, the idea here is like, each of us, we approach scripture, we approach our understanding of Jesus, and we approach our understanding of the church based on our experience. We all come with some lens. None of us comes lens free, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting, like, you go to an African-American church and there's a black Jesus, you know. You go to, you know, usually a white church, there's a white Jesus. You go, but what, Jesus was Middle Eastern, <laughs> you know. Like, uh, uh, but, you know, we all kind of, we just kind of put our own, our own backgrounds kind of shape. So this is true when it comes to the church as well. So I think <clears throat> one of the things that we ask in this is, like, where, where did the primary lens of the way we view church today come from? How, how, would you, how would you kind of describe your conception of what the church is, apart from those three things? Like, what do you usually think about when you think of church, what church is? Anybody? R rows of people. Yeah, we kind of come together for this meeting once a week, you know. Church is something usually that we go to, not necessarily something that we are. More often, that's what it, it is, right? That's, a, that's pretty telling. Where did this kind of idea come from, this, this dominant often unquestioned understanding of what the church is, especially in the United States. Um, in a farewell address to the nation in 1961, President Dwight Eisenhower gave a speech that became very famous because he used this term called the military industrial complex. Um, you know this one? Yeah. And uh, in it, Eisenhower basically warned of a growing danger of the military mindset of our nation stockpiling its cache of weapons, uh, ever expanding its investment in defense spending and increasing the size of our government. So military industrial complex was coined to, to kind of uh, explain the excessive push to weaponize to ensure security and safety. And so Eisenhower viewed our relationship with the military as increasingly becoming unhealthy. And the military over the years was demanding more and more money, uh, more of our economy, it was taking our best people and, and calling for more dominance in public consciousness. And so it was consuming uh, and consolidating all of our resources, and that's why he called it an industrial complex, okay? Uh, there's uh, authors, uh, Sky Jeff and I, and Scott Bessenecker, they've used Eisenhower's terminology to help describe the current cultural lens in which many people see the church, and they kind of coined the term Christian industrial complex. And it's a, it's, again, it's a mindset. It's a way that we see the church. There's this kind of unquestioned, undergirding concept of the church that's highly informed by the way 
our current culture in the United States sees success, you know? So to be successful in the American imagination is to grow bigger, to collect more resources, to consolidate power, to create stronger, higher growth structures, and have infinite rapid growth. Would you say that's somewhat the culture that we live in? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, all of this emphasizes the most obvious, simplistic, cultural signs of success. So whether, th this is, could be true for a church, whether you're a small church or a large church, whatever the size, um, often the American church leaders kind of live with the same thing. It's not uncommon if you go to a pastor's gathering for people to ask what question they're How many people? How many people go to your church? <laughs> That's the first thing, you know, it's about people, uh, budgets, and buildings. That's about what we've defined success as a whole. Uh, maybe you even live with that idea of what success is. Um, but Albert Einstein said, that which counts is often the most difficult to count. Um, and this is true. Um, we, I think we need a new lens in which to see the church. And, and this is the lens of church as movement as, a church, as opposed to church as an industrial complex. Um, church as an industrial complex is somewhat like a container. And it really kind of takes all of our resources and it puts it in the church. So whether it's, you know, leadership, uh, programs, or resources, it's all kind of piled in and consolidated in that, you know. It's to kind of grow the church to be bigger. And again, maybe the basic metrics is how many people come to our meeting uh, and, you know, is the budget well? Can we still staff people? That, that's not an uncommon way to look at church and success metrics today. And so this would be church's industrial complex. And uh, what, what, I, uh, what Dan and I are kind of proposing is it's, it's better to start to look at the lens of church's movement, which has a different focus, <coughs> where it's, it's kind of more about what's happening outside and what we're doing on mission and the multiplying. Uh, and, and it's kind of at, at heart it's saying it's not about how many people come here, it's about if, 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 uh, if God's reign were to be fully realized in North Hollywood, what would be different? If we, if you guys were absent from here, what would be missing? What would people miss? Would they miss community? You know, would they miss, you know, what, what things they miss? Or, or would, they, would people kind of celebrate, you know, that a church is gone? I mean, there may be some churches like that, right? So church as movement is, is really about being a blessing to the neighborhood, being a blessing to the world and multiplying that blessing. Not getting bigger, bigger, and bigger, but actually looking at multiplication as a different measure of success. Um, how many churches have we multiplied instead of how big did we grow our church? Um, and so there's a, and, and I think this is, this takes a, a little bit of, a, a, not just imagination for us, but it, it, this, this doesn't look as impressive at the beginning. That, than this does. If you're just focusing on getting a lot of people to a, a meeting, I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that do that well, right? Would you say? <laughs> you know, I went to a YouTube concert in New York, you know, a lot of people there. Um, you know, not just Christians, but, you know, getting people a meeting, that doesn't tell me much about what's happening. I want to know, is there a transformation taking place, you know, at the ground level in people's lives, in the places that we live, in the way that we work, and so forth. Um, you know, Jesus, uh, if you, uh, anybody familiar with the book of Mark in the Bible? Hmm. A few of you, all right. It's a, it's, a, it's a good book, one of the first Gospels written. <laughs> it's only 16 chapters, you could read it <laughs> a day. So, uh, but it's interesting, I did a 30-week series on the book of Mark. It's an amazing book. Um, and right in the middle of Mark, uh, chapter 8, there's an interesting thing that happens where Jesus encounters a blind man and uh, he takes some dirt and kind of throws it on his eyes right and and and, and it says the, the guy could see but only kind of like people were like trees so it was, it was a little bit blurry you know and then he kind of puts his hand on it again and then he sees clearly so the question is like why why did you know why did Jesus miracle not just take effect right away you know why these two stages well it's because if you kind of look at the context here um, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, there's, there's this kind of relationship between those who see and those who are blind and the impact that a person's sight or lack of sight has on them. Uh, literary critics have identified like three <coughs> characters in the story, in the Gospel of Mark. There's the disciples, 
there's the religious leaders, right? And then they're the minor characters, what we would call the uh, extras, right? Um, they, the, the disciples never seemed to get what Jesus was saying, you know? Jesus said to them, do you still not see or understand? Are, are your hearts hardened? Do you, not have, do you have eyes that, but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? Like these are the kind of questions he was asking his disciples. And, and Jesus uses many analogies and parables to help the disciples see, but they're still like half blind. And uh, even though they've been with Jesus, and Jesus is there explaining, you know, the parable of the seed to them, what that means, the disciples are still half blind to everything. So that because of their half blindness, this miracle was really kind of speaking to where the disciples were at in their own journey. Um, and, and I don't know about you, but, you know, in my 24 years of being a Christian, there's at times I realize I'm still pretty half blind to fully what Jesus, who he is, and what he really wants to do in this world and, and how he might want to use me. I, I believe that I'm, I'm culturally, the, the, the space that we live in kind of keeps me from seeing what, what ought to see. But it's interesting that sometimes we have to go outside our culture to see our own cultural lenses. And anybody travel overseas? Uh, what country have you guys been to? Japan. Italy, Russia, Germany, uh -huh. France. Cool. Scotland. What's your guys' favorite place? Mm -hmm. Japan. Barcelona. Yeah. I lived a couple of years in Japan. Well, yeah, I, I, I've had a chance to go to like 39 countries so far. My goal is 100. Um, and uh, a lot of times people don't even find me to come and speak. You know, All right, but when you when you go around the country today, where, where is the church to, like today growing and thriving the most, do you know, in the world? It's not in the West, so where, where might that be happening? It is growing, actually, by China. China. China is one place. Where else? Africa. African countries. Africa, yeah, all around Africa. Then East Asia and Latin America. I mean, really, pretty much everywhere except for that. It's doing quite well. And uh, and I and and so one of the things that we we tried to look at is interesting when you look at church history, that some of the brightest spurts of genuine growth have come in times of persecution, weakness, and suffering. Uh, genuine growth seems to come from vulnerability instead of strength. Um, today, I think about Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America. We would consider these places under-resourced, wouldn't we? Yeah. And yet the church is thriving. Uh, we have all kinds of resources, and yet we're on the decline. Uh, Roland Allen, in, uh, who studied the New Testament to kind of just, as he was a missionary to China and Africa, he just wanted, uh, he wondered why the practices that the mission agencies had was so ineffective. And so he really studied the New Testament just to say, what did Paul do? And uh, he wrote a book called The Spontaneous Expansion of the Church. And he talks about how in Mad, uh, Mad, Madagascar, I always have a hard time for in Madagascar, that for 25 years, all missionaries were driven from the island and severe persecution of Christians was instituted. And yet we're told that in that 25 year span, the Christian population uh, basically grew 10 times as much in that 25 years under heavy persecution. Uh, Alan Hurst in The Forgotten Ways, he writes about the time where Mao Zedong took power in China in 1949. And he instigated the purging of religion from society. And the church at that time that was modeled on Western forms of church was uh, estimated to be about two million people, okay, in China. Now, as a part of this systematic persecution, Mao banished all foreign missionaries and ministers. He nationalized all church property. He killed all of the senior leaders, uh, and then he either killed or imprisoned the secondary and and third level leaders. He banned all public meetings of Christians with the threat of death or torture, and then he proceeded to perpetrate one of the cruelest persecutions of Christians on historical record. And, and, and uh, as Mao Zedong kind of reigned until his death in 1976, the so-called bamboo curtain was opened up in the early 80s. And so the question was like, what happened to the church in this heavy time of persecution? Was it even going to exist anymore? And do you know the church grew from that 2 million to 60 to 80 million Christians during that time? They did this with none of the resources that we think are necessary to see movement take place. They had no professional clergy. They had no official leadership structures. They had no central organization. 
no mass meetings, and they grew like mad. When Hearst tells a story uh, about this, the, the Chinese church, he always mentioned that every person, every believer believed uh, they were a church planter, and every church plant saw themselves as a church planting church, you know? And uh, it's, in other words, in every seed is the potential of a tree, and in every tree is the potential of a forest. See, the early church, with little resources, under persecution also flourished, you know? Paul typically only spent a couple years in a place, and then he kind of moved on. And uh, when did he know it was good to move on? Uh, Roland Allen's study was revealed that it's when he felt like the, the Christians there trusted the Spirit in the same way that he trusted the Spirit, that he could leave them and go on and plant the next church. It wasn't uncommon, just two or three years, boom, and then he went on. Um, looking at these examples, I think I'm reminded of, at least, that our triune God is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. When we try to kind of take charge and manufacture growth, numerical growth might occur, but not genuine growth. Sometimes uh, some of the things that the church plant, you know, or growth, church growth movement or church plant movement, we sometimes seek to manufacture growth, uh, you know, through current pragmatic business practices or, or finding the 10 secrets, you know, to growing your church. This is not what we talk about. When I talk about church movement, that's not what I'm talking about. It's not a formula. It's faith in a God. Um, being movement is really recovering uh, the way that the church, uh, what we see the church in, 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 the, in the Acts and so forth, in the way of Christ and the power of the Spirit, allowing God to do what he sees fit. Uh, Paul said that, you know, I planted, Apollos watered, and what? You guys know this verse? And God causes the growth. All right, we've got to do more Bible study here. All right. <laughs> Uh, listen to what, uh, so our, our focus is to be faithful, and it's God's job to be fruitful. It's not my job, you know, with some kind of faith or where the church grows, but I am to be faithful to do what he calls us to do. So Roland Allen says this, by spontaneous expansion, I mean something that we cannot control. And if we cannot control it, we ought to, as I think, to rejoice in that we cannot control it. For if we cannot control it, it's because it's too great, not because it's too small for us. The great things of God are beyond our control. Therein lies a vast hope. Spontaneous expansion could fill the continents with the knowledge of Christ. Our control cannot reach as far as that. You know, notice that Jesus didn't say, well done, my good and fruitful servant. What did he say? My, well done, my good and what? Faithful. Faithful. All right. We got that one down. Right. When we try to control how fruitful we are, which isn't really possible, it leads to faith growth and passive needy disciples. Our job is simply to be faithful in the way of Christ, and as we do that, God will make it through. As we abide in the vine, it says that you know we will bear much fruit, and so that's the the focus. And so, church's movement is like the other thing about church's movement is this: when when Jesus kind of describes the parables of the kingdom, uh, let me give you one of them. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of seeds, yet when it grows. It's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds can come and perch in its branches. Uh, it's not uncommon as parables that the kingdom of God is something that starts small. It seems unimpressive, a little tiny seed. But in time, over time, it expands. It's like yeast, you know, it gets into the bread and, and it allows it to rise. You know, in our current culture, we want, we kind of mock the small, right? We often unimpressed with the small. We'd rather have fast, furious, and fantastical growth. Uh, yet the small needs our attention if we want to recover movemental beginnings. It's the small in the uh, in the disciples <clears throat> and how the disciples are formed. It's it's a small again. Like interesting that most places where movement has generally taken place weren't even able to have a big meeting because they couldn't have a public meeting. Uh, and yet the church grew quite well. It's in the small communities learning to gather under the essentials of what it means to be church that we kind of see the power of God at work. Now, when it comes to trying to define, uh, in our early, uh, we kind of sent our book out to a bunch of, well, the, the publisher sent it to anonymous readers, then I sent it to 15 friends. And uh, one of the things they wanted us to do is define, what do you mean church as movement? Can you define that better? Because it's one thing to kind of explain it and illustrate it through you know some of the ways that we did it right. How do you start to define it? And uh, 
I, I want to first say there's nowhere in Scripture that defines movement. I think we can observe it. And yet, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who have uh, started to write about church <coughs> movement uh, and, and tried to kind of come up with some definitions. So we've looked and read some of those things. We've read the critics of what people have to say about movement. We read the Scripture, and we look at some kind of just examples of what's happening. And so the hope is to kind of have a greater clarity of what movement is about uh, so that we can faithfully fulfill the commission to go and make disciples in where? Just North Hollywood. Just North Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good start. You know. to, all, to all nations, right? Or is, that, is, that, is that our calling as Christian? You guys here? Mm -hmm. right. Right. Have anybody seen the Derek's uh, Cyber or Cyber's TED Talk on how to start a movement? Anybody? It's, yeah. You should check it out. <coughs> how to start a movement. Uh, it went viral. It's kind of, I don't know how many people have seen it, but... Uh, he, he, it, it's basically a concert, right? And there's a band that's outdoor, and there's grass. And this guy gets up and he just starts kind of dancing. I mean, I really, that. really crazy. Yeah, you see it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he's just dancing and everybody else is kind of sitting down. Right? And then eventually one guy comes and joins him. So first he was a crazy guy, you know, just dancing on his own. But then now he's a leader because he has at least one follower. <laughs> and then over time, what happens is like a couple more people join in there. And then people are looking at them, and then they follow those people, and then those people follow those people. It's like, you know, multiplication three to four levels deep until it gets to the point that if you're not dancing, you're the crazy person. You know? <laughs> That's kind of a nice little illustration of movement. Um, but it kind of falls short in some ways because the music stops, maybe the dancing stops, and there's no real purpose necessarily to the movement. But I think it speaks to some aspects of what movement is. And so as I was trying to um, think through how would I define this, because you know, sometimes defining things can reduce them from what they are, right? I mean, it can be reductionistic. And so I, I'm always very careful on trying to define it well. And would you say that like, when we talk about plant, church planting movements, and then some we're talking about here, that, that the very first thing is that they need to start in God. That that's, makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and John tells us, we love because what? Jesus. He first loved us. See, you guys are, you got, you, got, you guys studied through John or something? Or <laughs> <laughs> Why do you guys know that one so well? All right. No. It's really popular. And then, <laughs> what's that? It's really popular. Yeah, I mean, it's a good one, right? Because it's like, it's uh, we want to love, but the only way we know, the only way we can really love is actually if, if we're love first. Uh, there's nothing like an unloved person. We've probably met some, but when we're loved, we have the ability to love other people. So it starts with, and, and then Paul prays this prayer in Ephesians that, that we might kind of get rooted in the love of God and, and know what the different dimensions he talks about, right? What are some of the dimensions? The to know the depth and the height and the width and the length of God's love. So if 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 kind of a movement starts in God and we're to be rooted in love, if we're going to be loving, then maybe the fruits, I thought, I started thinking, maybe the fruit of movement ought to have these four dimensions to it as well. Does that seem reasonable? Um, so <laughs> what, uh, I'm glad. Uh, I want, so let's look at a deep. So one of the things that's very common in movement literature is that uh, movement goes three to four generations deep, uh, and at least 50% non-Christians, as opposed to just people moving around churches. Okay. Now, I'll talk about this three to four. In other words, remember the day, the the TED talk. Like, uh, you know, there's one, and then there's the next generation of people come up, and then there's a bunch of people. It's like three to four generations deep in that video, okay? That's kind of the idea. Paul, you know, when he writes to Timothy, and he's talking about discipleship, which happens to be the core of movement, um, <clears throat> what does he say? He says, uh, the things that you have heard me say, this is in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses... <coughs> And trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So Paul is writing to Timothy. So Paul is first generation. Timothy is second generation. What you kind of share with a lot of people, 
pass on to reliable people, third generation, who can then pass it on to others, fourth generation. Okay? That's four generations of discipleship. It's kind of like, you know, go and make disciples. You make a disciple that makes a disciple that makes a disciple. Okay, church planting movement is three to four churches deep. So you started this church here in North Hollywood under, you know, with God's help. You go plant it. Another church gets started from here. And then that church starts another church. And then when that other one starts a church, you're starting to get at movement. Okay? Come on in. <laughs> um, and... 50% of people become, you know, non-Christians becoming Christians is the other part. Now, again, this is not necessarily a biblical definition, but it's, it's, a, it's a way to say, oh, is movement really taking place here? You know, um, this has happened in the U.S. The Jesus movement in the 60s were able to accomplish The Vineyard movement of Calvary Chapel actually saw this happen. So this is not something unattainable in the West. It's actually took place before. But the first thing, it goes four, four generations deep. And, uh, and at least, uh, you know, 50% new Christian, because it's about mission. It's about seeing people come to Christ, right? It's not just about people shuffling around churches. Uh, the way to do this is discipleship, if you didn't pick up in kind of uh, there. I, I like what Alan Hurst says. He says, uh, in kind of movement math, this is movement math for him. And what he's saying here, 12 is greater than 12,000, is that 12 disciples is more powerful than 12,000 people of religious goods and services that just come to a service and are passive, needy disciples. Uh, or maybe not even disciples. That's an important, interesting thing, right? So when you, when you focus on discipleship, what do I do with mine? I'm not a very good teacher on this thing, but like when you focus on discipleship, maybe have you guys ever seen like the difference between addition and multiplication? Is that like how it's worked? So I, I, I won't want to tell you, but let's say let's say a church adds a hundred thousand new people every year. Okay, that's pretty good, right? You would be impressed. Oh my gosh, God must be with you guys. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, like say here, this one only sees two. Now. This one is just kind of interested in adding people and kind of, you know, just kind of coming to a meeting. They're pretty satisfied, you know, budget's paid, I get to work, you know, like, looks, I'm pretty impressive, you know, look at how many people we got, you know, like, uh, that type of thing. Uh, multiplication, these two make one disciple that year. <laughs> and so they kind of multiply to four, right? So you can kind of follow this along. By the time you get to year 15, if you just follow this through, Obviously, here you got like 15, or you know, how many people? Something like that. This will be, you can have to do your work. It's, it's like three to four times more over, but it takes 15, year 15 before it ever surpasses. And when it surpasses, it does it by huge. Because multiplication is like a little mustard seed, you know, it looks very unimpressive. Uh, until it kind of becomes a tree that can house birds. Um, so don't don't despise the day of small beginnings, <laughs> and don't despise the small because that's really ultimately where movement takes place. Uh, so not only is it deep, but now we'll look at. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to do that one. You guys remember that, right? Generations. We're also kind of called the. So we also have the wide, right? Rooted. Wide in the love, so wide. What, what's wide? Well, you know, Acts 1 8, what does that say? When the, the, the Spirit comes upon you, go, go ahead, be my witnesses in Judea, Ju 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 Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other ends of the earth. Movement goes four, I like these four, four spheres wide. Okay, so in other words, like in some ways, as a trip plant, Noho is your Jerusalem. That's where you're starting. You know, Judea. You know, maybe that's, you know, outside of California or something. Samaria, uh, you know, that's probably West Virginia or something like that. <laughs> it. And then uh, Samaria, Samaria, significantly, Samaria was basically, you know, the Jews didn't like Samaritans. It's the people that you don't naturally like, the people that you don't get along with, the people that some people like to build walls, but, you know, we should be building bridges type of idea. Um, 
but sorry to get a little bit. <laughs> uh, that, but why it is kind of going out and it's going to the other ends of the earth. So movement now, churches and industrial complex and churches movement both want to go wide, but they go wide in different ways. The the churches and industrial complex goes wide, and in, in some ways it's more of a colonialization of of people. You know, it's like as if we're somehow coming and say we're gonna. We impart to you the image of God, but that's not the way it works. We don't come with our agenda or brand and franchising. When we go wide, I think the reason why Jesus, one of the reasons Jesus wants to go wide is because it's when we go into other cultures that we see our own cultural baggage and we learn a little bit more what it means like to be like Jesus. When I go to Kenya, if you've ever been to Africa, you can meet people who live very simply with great joy and a great sense of interdependence. Is there something that we might be able to learn from that, you know, in our in our country? Does, does that look a little bit like Jesus, someone who doesn't have a place to lay his head? Maybe you know, my cultural idea of being a Christian is quite different than what it was to be a Christian, and maybe what like Jesus' own experience was. Um, when I go to Italy, I learn about the holy kiss. Do we kiss people with a holy kiss today in America? No, like give me ten feet, you know. Like, you guys are pretty warm, you know, you give hugs and stuff like that. But uh, in Italy, you know, you, you'll get a kiss on the cheek, right? They teach you about the intimacy that can happen in, in Christ and brothers and sisters. Um, when I go to, when I've been to China and, and Ukraine and Latin places in Latin America, I've learned radical hospitality, where people give amazing things to you out of their need, not out of their access. So maybe, maybe Jesus wants us to go wide so that we actually learn our own cultural baggage that we keep carry with us. And we actually learn to be like Jesus as, as we try to say. The, the other thing is like, God is already at work before we get there. God, in his essence, is a missionary God. What do I mean by that? The Father sent the Son. The Father and Son sent the Spirit. And the triune God sent us into the world. You see, God in his very nature is missionary. It's, not, it's a part of who he is in his essence. He has much greater concern than any of us have about seeing this you know, great commission take place where everybody has an opportunity to live life in Jesus. And, and so he's already at work. The Spirit's already at work. We see this all, you know, you can think of different verses that will come here. So God's at work. So when we go to a place, we don't have to come with our plans and agendas. We have to say, where is God at work and how do we join in that work? You see the posture is different? If I'm going with my agenda, I will, I will ultimately, you know, you go to Kenya, which one of the weird things is like, you know, if you go to preach in a church there, when I, in the churches I go to, you have to wear a suit, tie, and, or you can, I found out you could also wear one of the Kenyan traditional dresses, so that's what I got, not dress, but you know, like some pants and silky stuff, and like, I didn't want to wear a tie, like, where did that come from? <laughs> like, you know, they're singing like, you know, 16th century British hymns. And there, I'm thinking, like, is that, what did we do wrong here? <laughs> like, what happened? You know? That's, uh, and there's a lot of worse other things, right, with the colonialization of things. So we're not called to colonialize. Uh, we're not called to capitulate to the culture either, but we're called to contextualize. And, and that means, like, understand God's already at work. How do we join him? And, the, and, and what does that mean? Do you see the postures are different? So both churches, industrial complex and churches movement, desire to go wide, but they go with much different kind of postures. Um, and uh, then long, and this is uh, at least uh, four generations long. And what I mean by that? Moses writes in Deuteronomy 6, 119, these are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord commanded me to teach you, and you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord God as long as you live. So he, he's writing to the people of Israel, and they're to teach to their children and their grandchildren, four generations. You see that? Uh, in other words, um, the church's industrial complex often puts greater value on the personality of the senior leader, sizable impact, rapid growth, desiring immediate return, if you will, on their investment, while the church's movement puts greater value on shared leadership, sustainability, and faithfulness, leaving fruitfulness to God. You see, when the, when the church is built around a personality, once that personality has left, the movement comes to an end, right? We've seen this many times in, in our day. Uh, much like the seed that fell into the rocks, the seed sprouted quickly, 
uh, but it soon withered in the sun because there was no soil. It was too shallow. So if for the sake of movement, one sacrifices his family on the altar of immediate impact and rapid growth, then the typical result is the next generation is tragically lost. You see, the church's movement considers how what we do now shapes the future of those who come after us. Just like uh, corporations in the industrial age in our time, in their desire for immediate impact and rapid growth have left us with polluted waters that sometimes are unfit to swim in, or air that's <coughs> less desirable to breathe, putting greater values, if you will, on the immediate impact and rapid growth instead of sustainability and faithfulness. Um, and th if, if we, if we th th this kind of desire for rapid speed, it often has unintended consequences that we need to think about. Uh, because the church's industrial complex worships speed and rapid growth, too often our neighbor, our neighborhood and our neighbors become an object of mission. The church's movement, on the other hand, sees our neighbor as fellow subjects in the story of God, pointing people to the center who is Jesus, who is not an imperial power, but a slain lamb. Different posture. And then, hi. Huh? Okay. How much do you <laughs> There's a high cost to both, both church as an industrial complex and church as movement both have a high cost. Uh, emotional hits are some of the worst. But the church as movement has one additional one that the church as an uh, industrial complex doesn't have. And that's that because it's very unimpressive, especially at the beginning. You have to kind of not only deal with all of the other pressures that everybody has, but you have to deal with how other people see you and view you. You know, even here, Paul, I'm sure. Like, oh, you go. What church you go? Oh, like, oh, how many people go? <laughs> Who goes? <laughs> um, if that's kind of the measurement, <laughs> you know, that's kind of a you know a shallow measurement. Uh, maybe we ought to judge like based on and how many people live in joy and love and peace and have a sense of faithfulness to their, you know, to the people they know, you know, the fruit of the spirit, if you will. Uh, we can't count that statistically. Some things you can only tell by, you know, count by stories. Qu quality is usually done better by stories. Uh, stats are not unimportant, but stats usually only can measure quantity, not quality. And, and I would say that we need to measure both. Um, so if you don't have your identity in God as a, as a leader or as a church, then you might you may be uh, you, you might be kind of you know while other people might be unimpressed with what's happening you have to know what church's movement is so that you and, and, and that it's not about what other people think it's about what is God calling you to do and you're being faithful and God who knows there's a tipping point that happens in anything I, I remember my first plant really really rough first five years were rough I was about ready to throw the towel in and then boom like. We just were about faithfully making disciples and multiplying these mid-sized group, and God blessed it. And it was kind of, you know, beyond that, it was hard to explain other than God. So let me, how, how do we make this happen? What time do we have? Maybe seven to nine minutes. Oh, my God. Where's my thing? I thought we'd go on. To ten. All right. Oh, yeah. All right. Just four things real quick. Are you guys still yeah. with me? Mm -hmm. Still with you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so uh, I, four real things. This is this would be called like the anatomy of movement. So, are you? Can you kind of see the difference between churches and industrial complex churches movement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how? What does it look like uh, to see churches movement take place? There's there's four things that that I think about. Dog, dogmatic depth. Um, ecclesial essentials. Ecclesi oh, I'm just going to say them. Ecclesial essential. Um, <laughs> minimalistic methods and transferable tools. Okay. What do I mean by this? Like uh, dogmatic depth. Th there's some things. Is there something that you believe with kind of like it's dogma for you? Everybody has some dogma, right? Like I'm convinced of this. We all have dogma. Um, movement needs to have dogma in the right places, because there's some truth out there that you know we that is is 
is, you know, like Paul says in Romans 14, some people have this opinion, other people have this, let each person be convinced in their own mind. We don't have to believe all the same things on everything, right? But there's some things that we ought to be convinced of. Like Paul said, you know, I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, which is in God. Nothing, you know, not, you know, not angels, not demons, not, not if I'm in the highest of heavens or the, the deepest of the oceans, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. He was convinced of it. That's a good thing to be convinced of. I'm convinced that one died for all so that all might live. That's a good thing to be convinced of. What are some other things that's important to have dogmatic depth if you want to see movement? The one, as I already told you, is that at the very center of the universe is a missionary God. That's the God that we as Christ followers worship. He's missionary on his own. That He's already at work. We just have to join him. In the beginning was community. There's this unending dance of the Father, Son, and Spirit that out of that rich relationship, creation came. But in the beginning, you know, we, we might know the history of God, but what about the, or we might know the, the God of history, but we also need to know the history of God, and that God is, is relational in his very being. That's why we need community. That's why community is one of the core elements of what it means to be the church. And yet, church's industrial complex sometimes even prevents us from having community because there's no time to be in community relationally with each other because I got to do another program, I got to do another service. Uh, community is core. Um, another dogmatic depth <coughs> is understanding that the good news is 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 huge. It's big. It, it encompasses everything. In other words. Uh, it's not just about me and Jesus, but the good news shapes uh, our society. It shapes even the cosmic world. In other words, our faith is personal. It's not private. It's public. Uh, think about, and, and so uh, think about Jesus. What, what, what is, and, and this kind of gets into the, I'm not going to necessarily hit the, all of these. You don't have to get the book. We don't have the time. All right. I do want to hit this real quick. This is an important thing to keep in mind when it comes to movement. A little bit smaller. All right, so we got four circles here. Uh, Edward Hall was, was a sociologist in the 1960s that talked about like being a part of the human race, that we have four spaces of belonging, kind of a need for being involved in four spaces. Uh, this would be public space. In public space, Essentially like 70 or more people in a public type of space. Uh, the next would be social space. And social space is probably more like, you know, 20 to 50. How many people you can kind of stuff into this place probably? You know? um, personal space is kind of more like, you know, 6 to 12. Um, and then intimate space is kind of like uh, 3 to 4 people. So we all have kind of a need for these spaces. Now, interesting, let's look at the ministry of Jesus. How did he use these spaces? He confided in the three, James, Peter, and John. He trained the twelve. He mobilized the seventy. And he spoke riddles and parables to the crowds. <laughs> now here's the answer. Why did Jesus... There's a my... That means I have uh, five minutes. All right. <laughs> Supposed to be ten minutes, but we'll get five. Um, why did Jesus speak parables to the crowd? Why did he say things, you know, you know, like, why didn't he just kind of give it out plain? Anybody? Why didn't he just speak plainly what he was on his mind? Why parables? So that they would maybe ask more questions and be more inquisitive. Okay. That's... Yeah, there, there's, there's things that parables can do, they kind of work on us. Parables are often like a, both a, a, a mirror and a window, a mirror to our own hearts and a window to new realities. Uh, so that's, I think there's an element, there's, there's all kinds of reasons. Let me give you, because of time, one other reason. Um, <laughs> and, and this is kind of, why, why did John, when he's writing Revelation, use apocalyptic literature? Why did the prophets sometimes write in these kind of, you know, I mean, I wish you know, just tell us what it is. Why do I have to go and interpret all of this now? Uh, well, because they were, when, you, when you, you speak in poems and poetry and parables, when your message is a threat 
to the current reigning powers that be. Jesus was a king with a kingdom. Remember at his birth, somebody, you know, they, they killed all the kids in his area two, two years and under. They killed them all. Why? Because this Messiah, this, this was a threat to the king at the throne. You know, Jesus' message was political in nature. He was sent to Israel, the nation of Israel. It was a political message. He, he took his message all around Israel, much like, you know, a politician today. It was like the Sermon on the Mount was his platform. Uh, he didn't stay in one place with the crowds. Usually he was everywhere else. But it was subversive. It was subversive because he was saying there's a different kingdom that's breaking in to the earth right now. And, 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 and he's calling people to live in that kingdom. That was a threat to the powers that be. That's why it ultimately led him to the crucifixion, right? It was the Romans and the Jews that put him. The Jews put him there because he claimed to be a Messiah, and they thought they weren't that he wasn't. And the Romans were threatened by this movement. Public, that's a little different public space than today, right? Remember when Jesus was speaking, even in his hometown? What happened after he spoke there? They got mad at him, and they wanted to throw him off a cliff. Paul, when he would speak about the kingdom of God, they sometimes created a riot in his town. We go and hear the preaching, and we say, nice message, Pastor. <laughs> it's like, what's the difference here? You know, there's one that was threatening real reality and real life, and, and Jesus' kingdom was like that. So that's how we use his faith. He mobilized the 70, but uh, Jesus took his disciples on this journey to these places, but his real work was here. This is the grassroots part of movement, what happens in this space. This is just like the political rallies, okay? It's getting this, we don't have a private message, it's a public, so we find ways to get it out. How often, you know, who cares? It's kind of like, but the, at some point we have to say, this isn't just a private thing, it's a public thing. This is a grass work. If, if he's gonna get his message out, he knew that he had to focus in particular on training these 12 because in three and a half years he was gonna be gone and he was gonna leave it to them. And it was a good investment of time and energy. Uh, Jesus was skeptical of the crowds. He often kind of, you know, even when he did something, he was like, don't tell anybody, because he knew the crowds were fickle, and that wasn't his point. Like to, he, he, he had to train these people, and so he invested here, and he mobilized at 70, and he had confined the street. This is where church's movement really sparks. And so as you're here in this place, you guys are a beautiful example of the grassroots part of movement. You know, this is the, the space in China that all the space that they had, they weren't even able to get to that space. Most movements that happen in the world actually have just focused on that space, partly because they were not able to be public, or when they were public, it was pretty harsh and not many people lived in, you know, but the, there is the blood of the martyrs as a seat for the church, but, but this is a grassroots. You guys, you guys are doing this in a beautiful way, I have to tell you, like, and it takes a confidence in God and having your, your, who you are in God to be strong. So you're not just comparing them with what's happening here and others. Real transformation happens when we get close. Jesus, I mean, he, he picked the 12 partly because, you know, it represents the 12 tribes of Israel, but partly it was because you can't have transformation from a distance. Mission doesn't happen well in distance. It comes when you're close up. And you just don't, and when he took his human body on, when God decided to become man, he limited himself to a human body, to one place and one time and, and, and one area. We like, you know, we, we have with our media, we kind of spread ourselves out to all the world, you know. I, I'm, I'm, I do that as well. <laughs> Whereas Jesus kind of lived in himself because there's something powerful about flesh and blood connection and relationship that we are more and more lacking in our time. Community, community, commission. Um, I think we'll just have to end it there, and I, I, I know you guys probably, maybe you have some questions, but I'm kind of stopping at that point, because of time. <laughs>